Welcome to the latest installment of my dad listens to this. I'm Juliet the daughter. And that must make me Kevin the dad. Yeah, it must. And today, we are covering, in tribute, the album Truth by Jeff Beck. So dad, what do we need to know? Well, we need to know that Jeffrey, G-E-O-F-F-R-E-Y. Ah, very English. Yes. Jeffrey Arnold Beck was born June 24th, 1944 in Wallington, Sutton, South London, England. Love those British locations. Make it more English than that. No. Nope. Uh, to parents Arnold and Ethel Beck. When Jeff was six years old, he heard Les Paul playing guitar on How High the Moon. He asked his mother what it, that sound was. She told him it was an electric guitar, and that did it. Les Paul was a big influence on Beck's playing, along with Cliff Gallup from Gene Vincent's Blue Caps, B.B. King, Steve Cropper from Booker T and the MGs, and Lonnie Mack. As a teen, Beck learned to play on a borrowed guitar and also built his own out of a scar box for the body, hmm. part of a picture frame for the neck, and string from a radio-controlled airplane. Hmm. Eventually, he got the real thing. Jeff also worked on cars with one of his uncles and would work on restoring classic cars throughout his life. Whilst attending the Wimbledon College of Art, Jeff Beck played in various rock and roll groups, including Screaming Lord Such and the Savages. Such was Alice Cooper before Alice Cooper was Alice Cooper. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. In 1963, Ian Stewart of the Rolling Stones introduced Beck to R&B music. Hello, R&B music. Hello, Beck. <laughs> Jeff started playing in bands that were more R&B, such as the Tridents, but he would rock things up. He started getting work as a session guitarist. This led fellow session guitarist Jimmy Page to recommend Jeff Beck as Eric Clapton's replacement in the Yardbirds, as Clapton felt the band was getting too pop for his tastes and left. Hmm. Hmm. Ugh, anyway, <laughs> Beck joined the Birds in 1965, and during his almost two-year stint with the band, they recorded most of their top 40 hits. Isn't that something? Clap his wings and they get bigger. <laughs> anyway, in May 1966, he recorded Beck's Bolero using Jimmy Page, John Paul Jones, Nicky Hopkins, and Keith Moon. Keith was actually thinking of leaving The Who at the time, but changed his mind at the end of the session. Mm. In June, Jimmy Page joined the Yardbirds, so now they had twin lead guitars. You can see this lineup in the nightclub scene in the movie Blow Up, which I've seen. It's a good movie, and it seems like that's where Mike Myers stole a lot for the first Austin Powers movie. Uh. Jeff Beck was fired from the Yardbirds in 1967 for being a no-show uh -oh. and for his bouts of perfectionism as well as explosive temper. Uh. Also in 67, he recorded some singles for producer Mickey Most, including Hi-Ho Silver Lining and Tallyman. Also in 1967, Pink Floyd wanted Jeff to replace Sid Barrett as the guitarist, but according to Floyd's drummer Nick Mason, none of the band members had the nerve to ask him. Also in 1967, Jeff Beck formed the, wait for it, Jeff Beck Group. Okay. Main, mainstays were Jeff Beck, a no-brainer, yeah. Rod Stewart on vocals, and Ron Wood on bass. This was a big break in Rod's career as it turned out to be his major label debut. He was in the band called Steam Packet, but they never had a proper recording like on a major label. Uh. Anyway, drummers came and went at first, but Rod recommended Mick Waller, who lasted the longest, almost a year and a half. <laughs> Beck signed a contract with Mickey Most, who became his manager as well as producer. Most was not interested in the other band members, which is why Beck's first album, Truth, is credited to just Jeff Beck on the cover. Mm. His second album, 1969's Beckola, would be the first credited to the Jeff Beck group. Beckola. Beckola. <laughs> yep. The band toured the U.S. four times. For the fifth and final tour, they stuck mostly to the East Coast, even playing at the Newport Jazz Festival. Oh. They would have played Woodstock, but Beck broke up the band the night before. Oh, shit. Wow, a, that sucks. A decision he later regretted. Yeah, I bet. I bet. The band had by this time been fighting with each other, and Rod was thinking of a solo career with Ron Wood and Mick Walla following him. Beck was on the verge of forming a trio with bassist Tim Bogert and drummer Carmine Appice, both from Vanilla Fudge, but he fractured his skull in a car accident. Ow! 
They would form their group in 1972, but before that, there were more iterations of the Jeff Beck group. He would dabble in soul, R&B, and jazz with his lineups, and they were many and varied. Mm. Beck, Boger, and Appis came out in 1973. It included the cover of Stevie Wonder's Superstition, which Beck played guitar on Stevie's original version. BBA got okay reviews. They broke up in 1974 before their second studio album was finished. There was a live album, Live in Japan, that was only released in Japan. And you have it. No, I don't. Oh. <laughs> and it came out in 1975. I'm sure when it was remastered or whatever, it was made available everywhere. Oh. Also in 1975, Jeff Peck put out Beck. Buh, 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 put out what became his highest charting and one of his best review albums, Blow by Blow, produced by one George Martin. Oh, wow. It was all instrumental jazz rock. It was... <clears throat> Excuse me, it was also his second album to be credited to him as a solo artist. More jazz rock albums followed with Wired and There and Back and touring. Lots of touring. And then the 1980s. Uh-oh. In 1981, Jeff Beck played a series of Amnesty International Benefit concerts, oh. playing with Eric Clapton. Beck also <laughs> played the Arms concert to raise money for multiple sclerosis research. This time he played not only with Clapton, but Jimmy Page as well. In 1985, he released Flash, which featured vocalists, mostly, most notably Rod Stewart, singing a cover of the impressions, People Get Ready. It was released as a single and became a big hit. Also in the 80s, Beck played on The Honey Drippers, which was mo mainly Robert Plant and Jimmy Page. Okay. They put out a five-song EP, mm. like big band, early rock and roll stuff. Okay. Okay, so anyway, People Get Ready. It was released as a single, became a big hit, and it also showed that Rod could sing a song and mean it when he wanted to. Because nah. 80, 80s Rod is... Um, that's a story for another podcast. Anyway, <laughs> Jeff won his first Grammy for Best Rock Instrumental for the song Escape. He would go on to win that Grammy five more times. He also won Best Pop Instrumental in 2010 for his version of Nessun Dorma. Hi. He also won a Grammy for something called Best Pop Collaboration with vocal, Vocals for Imagine. This featured Herbie Hancock, Pink, India Ari, Konono No. 1, and Omu Sangare. Hmm. And Jeff Beck. Yeah. In 1989, Jeff put out Jeff Beck's Guitar Shop. He was back to playing instrumentals, but this time finger-picking instead of using a pick or plectrum. Oh, okay. Oh, also in the 1980s, uh. the movie This Is Spinal Tap came out. Oh, nice. Nigel Tufnell was based on Jeff Beck, and Christopher Guest was a dead ringer for Beck in the movie. Okay, well, now I know. Absolutely. All right. And then the 90s. Wait, did Jeff Beck ever see Spinal Tap? That I don't know. I couldn't find anything about Damn it. him in a reaction. Oh. Uh. And then the 90s. Mm hmm Jeff Beck put out only one solo album, 1999's Who Else? Yeah. He did put out two other albums that were collaborations, Frankie's House with Jed Lieber and Crazy Legs, a Gene Vincent tribute album with the Big Town Playboys. Also, he was playing with Bon Jovi, Kate Bush, Roger Waters, and was a featured performer on the Days of Thunder movie score. In 1992, he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as a member of the Yardbirds. Then came the 2000s, more of the same. He's just playing everywhere and playing on more albums for others, including Kelly Clarkson and Toots and the Maytals. No shit. How's huh. that for a difference? <laughs> and getting inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame again, this time as a solo artist in 2009. In the 2010s, he put out his two final solo albums, 2010's Emotion and Commotion, which features Ness and Dorma, and mm -hmm. 2016's Loud Hailer. He also received not one, but two honorary degrees for music, one from the University of Arts London and the University of Sussex. In 2013, he toured with Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys. Hmm. In the 2020s, he collaborated with Johnny Depp on an album called 18, which was released in June 2022. Jeff Beck died from bacterial meningitis Oof. on January 10th, January 10th, 2023. 
he was 78 years old. Hmm. Now, as for me, Jeff Beck was one of those musicians I'd always heard of, but had not heard a lot of his stuff. And maybe that sums up Jeff Beck. He's a guitarist's guitarist. When I told your mom Jeff Beck died, her first words were, who is he? Oh. Yeah. And then when you explained it? <clears throat> she was still a little lost. <laughs> but then, you know, I sent her Ness and Dorman and she's like, I love this guy. <laughs> He once said he was glad he was never famous. He'd never been able to deal with it. He was happy just to be successful. He did what he loved, he was great at it, and he made a decent living from it. There you go. Yep. I picked up the remastered CD of Truth at a library sale for a buck a few years ago, probably 2019. I was surprised at how many songs I already knew, having heard them on the radio over the years, but never realizing it was Jeff Beck. And sure, I'm embarrassed. As for Truth, the remaster came out in 2006 with eight bonus tracks. The booklet is a great read. Charles Sher Murray wrote the notes, and Jeff Beck himself puts in his two cents on every song, and he is brutally honest. Mm -hmm. Some of the songs, he hates. <laughs> yeah, bonus tracks. He was talking about some of you. And the booklet is just essential reading. The songs that make up Truth were recorded in four days in May of 1968. The tracks are mostly covers because at the time, no one in the band was really a songwriter. Mm. Three songs are credited to one Jeffrey Rod. Really, Jeff Beck and Rod Stewart. Uh. The cover picture is a double exposure photograph of Beck's girlfriend at the time, model Celia Hammond. They had a long-term relationship from 1968 to 1992. Wow. Before that, Jeff was married to Patricia Brown from 1963 to 1967. In 2005, he married Sandra Cash. He has no children. Okay. That he ever knew of anyway. <laughs> the album came out in the U.S. in July of 68 and got rave reviews. It's also looked on as one of the first albums to herald the coming of heavy metal. Oh, really? Coming out six months before Led Zeppelin's debut. I wouldn't call it metal so much as heavy blues. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like Zeppelin's de debut, but it's also looked on as like ground zero because you got to start somewhere. Okay. Basically, they're taking the blues and like really slowing it down and just playing loud. Mm -hmm. And let's dive into this. First track. Because I, I really want to hear your two cents. Shape of Things. Um, I don't think I like Rod Stewart's voice. He's not straining himself like Michael Bolton, but there's something about his voice that rubs me the wrong way. However, I do like Jeff Beck's guitar playing here. And I thought I liked the other instruments until there were these weird vocal eases in the background from some soprano. Maybe I just like an album of all Jeff Beck instrumentals. But then there's this staccato part where the notes are played short and sharp and it sounds like the song is dying almost. I don't like it that much. As for the Yardbirds, I love how it's a rock march. I love marches. It's one of the reasons why the mob song from Beauty and the Beast is my favorite. And I'm listening to the original Yardbirds version wondering, why did he try to change it so much? I get wanting to put your own spin on things, but this cover is a little too out there, and the lead singer's voice for the Yardbirds is so much better. Go with the original on this one, folks. Okay, as you said, this was done, first done by Jeff's previous band, the Yardbirds. It's looked on <clears throat> as possibly the first psychedelic rock song. It managed to be both pro-environment and anti-war in its lyrics. It was credited to Jim McCarty, Paul Samuel Smith, and Keith Ralph, though Samuel Smith said Beck should have gotten the writer's credit also for his contributions to the song's development. Mm. As for Beck's version, you know why it's on here? Why? Because Rod Stewart loved the song. Oh. And Beck wanted to slow it down and make it heavier sounding. I don't like it. Mission accomplished. I still like it. And musically... It sounds a lot like early Zeppelin, even though, like I said before, Truth came out six months before that band's debut album. So maybe early Zeppelin sounds more like early Jeff Beck group. Anyway, Mick Waller on drums and Jeff on guitar are killing it. During the soloing, it sounds like the drums and guitar are having a conversation with each other, like Page and Bonham eventually would in Led Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. And ooh, it makes me wonder, sorry, <laughs> How much of truth Page and his new band appropriated? We'll find out later. <laughs> At least Zeppelin were equal opportunity appropriators. They stole er appropriated from everyone. Like Picasso said, good artists borrow, great artists steal. <laughs> Next track, Let Me Love You. 
Now, I gotta ask, Rod's voice, it it's always sounded like that. Why do you, you like it? It's not something he's doing on purpose. No, I just don't like it. No? Can't explain it. Never have liked it, never will? I don't know, I've only heard one other song, Tonight's the Night. Mm-hmm. And uh, I haven't listened to enough of that to form a judgment. And I'm sure Nana's played him at some point while I was over at her house once, but I wasn't paying attention. Okay. So I can't judge yet, but I can judge him on this album, though. Judge away. Right. That's what we're here for. Next track, Let Me Love You. Rod's voice is better here than on the previous track. This isn't so much Let Me Love You as Let Me Take You to Bed. The lust is radiating off this guy as the object of his affection shakes like a willow tree. Sometimes I'm in the mood for lust songs, but that day I wasn't, so I was grateful for Jeff Beck drowning out Rod. And his guitar <laughs> solos are great. He's best when he's just straight rocking and not being experimental. He provides the restraint against Rod's vocals, and Rod himself seems to tone it down to let Jeff take center stage, which I appreciate. An interesting touch is when Rod sounds breathless and stops singing like he can't take it anymore. And the good news is I didn't start to get bored until the end of the song, so take that as a win, guys. <laughs> First known as Baby Let Me Love You, written by Willie Dixon and recorded by Buddy Guy. But one Jeffrey Rod gets credit here. As Beck says in the CD booklet, there was a lot of conniving going on back then. Change the rhythm, change the angle, and it's yours. This happened to Dixon a few times. In 1972, the publishing arm of Chess Records sued Led Zeppelin over Bring It On Home. And in 1985, for a whole lot of love. And also, Willie Dixon got in on the action in 1985, suing Led again for a whole lot of love. In both cases, settlements were reached out of court, and Dixon gets a writing, songwriting credit on both those songs. Beck also said, we just slowed it down and funked it up with a little Motown-style tambourine. And damn me if some of this doesn't sound like Diana Ross and the Supreme's reflections. This is mostly due to Ron Wood's bass playing. Reflections came out in July of 1967, so anything's possible. Someone could do a mashup of both those songs and it would work perfectly. Rod does most of the singing, and I think it's Jeff that comes in singing a few lines. Mm -hmm. I think, because if you listen closely, there's someone else who comes in and sings a few lines absolutely clearly, and it's not Rod. Good solid blues workout. Love how the song ends, though, when Rod just comes in with that last... Crazy. I think I must have tuned that part out. Next track, Morning Dew. Oh, oh wait a minute, sorry. Um, one more thing. You can see Buddy Guy and Jeff Beck play Let Me Love You at the White House back in 2012 on YouTube. Oh, I, I have... think I... Did, is that the one where Obama sang Sweet Home Chicago for like five seconds? I don't know. Might be. Everyone's in the suit, but Jeff. <laughs> That's great. Next track, <clears throat> Morning Dew. This one is definitely romantic than Let Me Love You, and Rod seems more apologetic saying, let's take a walk, I want to be gentle, and I'm sorry for what I did to you, I'm ashamed. Then the girl seems to say, I heard someone crying, was that you? And Rod's like, maybe it was you crying, shut up! No, it was you, Rod, it's okay. You can cry, we won't think less of you. And then the guitar plays his inner agony, making this song a bit more sad and tortured. And now there is no morning dew because the relationship is over and she left. And I know we're focusing on the guitar playing, but the piano flourishes here are gorgeous. Nikki Hopkins. Jeff Beck's playing at the end is gorgeous, too, as the romance winds down. I just noticed the piano more in this one. Mm -hmm. uh, this was written in 1962 by Bonnie Dobson, with Tim Rose later taking some credit for augmenting the song in some way. Details are murky, but Dobson still questions Rose's right to his co-writing credit. Apparently, the split is 75 Bonnie, 25 Rose. Bonnie wrote it as a dialogue between the last man and last woman on Earth after an apocalyptic catastrophe. She was inspired to write the song after seeing the movie On the Beach about survivors of a nuclear holocaust. It still comes across to me as enigmatic, though. When I first heard the lines about, please walk me out in the morning dew, I thought, well, this could be about someone walking their dog. With a dog go for a walk, go for a walk. <laughs> That's just me. <laughs> you know, it, it shows what I know. But now that I do know it, I think the music fits the song, music fits the mood perfectly. And bagpipes mm -hmm. are credited to, and I quote, mysterious Scottish bloke. Oh, huh, okay. Maybe they want to be anonymous or something. I don't know. Next track, You Shook Me. Okay, what they do with this song is fascinating. They take the blues and add some techno elements with the synths, and a beginning that sounds more like Morse code along with honky-tonk piano. Mm -hmm. Yet when I hear the phrase, 
You shook me. All I can think of is ACDC with you shook me all night long. I want to feel like I'm being shaken, not like I'm going to be yawning. I'm just not buying what they're selling with this. Even the showing off in the guitar didn't stimulate me, save for the two-minute mark. That was pretty impressive. As for the original Muddy Waters version, he definitely has a richer voice than Rod. I was getting sick of Rod by this point and just wanted an album full of instrumentals. I didn't want to talk about this track anymore, and I debated going back to re-listen to this and write a better critique, but this track didn't deserve more time and energy than I gave it, so there. As for the Led Zeppelin version, oh man, can Robert Plant sing. That one's brewing with passion and made me excited for a Led Zeppelin coverage. That was like water in the desert. Holy shit. <laughs> I was like, why are you listening to these guys? Who listen to them? Hey, I don't pick them. You pick them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Willie Dixon did get the songwriting credit on this one. Jeff and the band get it done in 2 minutes and 28 seconds. Zeppelin would get it done in 6 minutes and 28 seconds on their debut. John Paul Jones played on both. This is a blues standard. Everyone's done it. Muddy Waters did it first in 1962. Jeff's came out in 68. And Zeppelin's in 69. And then, of course, Trablish. Oh, no. Yeah, because once again, Led Zeppelin this time was accused of stealing Beck's version. Jimmy Page swore he never heard it. But Beck stated Page had accompanied manager Peter Grant to several Jeff Beck group gigs in the United States. Rod Stewart also made a similar claim. Plus... Grant gave Page an advanced copy of Truth. Plus, John Paul Jones played on both versions. Mm. You'd think at some point when he was with Led Zeppelin, he would have said, yeah, I remember playing this with, uh, with Jeff Beck's group. Yeah, mm. yeah. So grab a pencil so you can draw your own conclusions. <laughs> anyway, yeah, classic blues song. Man praises woman for shaking him all night long, moves him like a hurricane, but then on the other hand... All that shaking has messed up his happy home. My poor wife and kids. This version starts off with what sounds like a frog with laryngitis. <laughs> and then Rod comes in and we're off. Nippy, Nicky Hopkins. Nippy Hopkins. Oh my God. <laughs> Nicky Hopkins is on piano and John Paul Jones plays him and organ. Both prominently displayed. Jeff's very brief solos come in towards the end. <laughs> but they're good though. All right. Next track. Old Man River. Ah, yes, the signature Hammerstein Kern ballad for his bass singers from the musical Showboat. Watch the Ashley Simpson parody Family Guy did with this song. It's hilarious. Now, this song is sung by Joe in the original stage show, contrasting the never-ending hardships of black workers with the endless, uncaring flow of the Mississippi River. The black men who plant the potatoes are forgotten, but the river keeps flowing on. As for Jeff's version, it sounds sinister with the drums and bass solo in the opening. As for Rod, I don't like him singing this song. I just don't, and I'm going to tell you why. Why? He seems too cool and above it all, not convincing as the character. Please get someone else to sing it, who you can tell when they open their mouth, has sweated and toiled their way through life. Not a solid middle-class boy from North London. The song loses its power that way. Stick with the original, or with the one performed at the Kennedy Center Honors for Hal Prince, where that guy got a standing ovation, and I forget that guy's name. I'm sorry, Carl Castle said it earlier in the video, but I forgot. Carl Castle? Yeah, when he was narrating the Kennedy Center Honors back then. Huh. And also, if we just had an instrumental, or if they got some other singer here, it would have been perfect, but nope. Yep, so, like you said, written by Ox Oscar Hammerstein and Jerome Kern from the musical Showboat. Mm -hmm. That's Keith Moon on timpani. Really? Just going nuts. Yep. <laughs> okay. How did this song get on here? Oh, Ed. Rod Stewart loved it. And really? He also loved Paul Robeson. The guy who sang it originally? Yeah, that was. Yes, in, that was did him. you watch the YouTube? Yeah, obviously I did. The one thing that kept getting to me, though, was I know it's a character, but when he sang it, it was Old Man River instead of River. Oh, oops. And then towards the end, you have that cast joining in, and they all sing River. Mm hmm. And I'm like, you could sing River if you want, but like I said, he was probably keeping in... In character, yeah. In character. What did Jeff say when he suggested this? Okay. Oh, okay. I don't know. I'm assuming because they, um, like I said, none of them were songwriters and they needed enough material to fill out an album. Mm -hmm. Jeff thought there should have been a huge choir on this to complement Moon's timpani playing in that this just sounds like a demo. I'm sorry, but great vocal performance by Rod. I don't think anyone else could have put it across like he did. Nah. This is the curveball of truth because it's just so unexpected. And thus, this is the end of side one. So we flip over the record 
put the needle down for side two, or you just let the CD run, or your um, music platform, whatever. Mm -hmm. And the next song is... Is it Green Sleeves? Yes, it is. Okay. This is a nice little classical palette cleanser with acoustic guitar, something you can just chill to and appreciate how well-versed Jeff Beck is with his playing. He would have been a fine minstrel in the olden days. I think my favorite version uh, that I've heard of this was the one my music and medicine professor, Dr. Breen, played on violin. He'd always play a piece for us to chill out to after we handed in a term paper and we were all burnt out. He'd be like, you guys want to hear a song? We'd be like, yes, please. I also never realized the melody was reused for the Christmas Carol, What Child Is This? So now you know. And you could play this version for Christmas if you wanted to. So there you go. Jeff Beck for Christmas. There you nice go. soothing. Yeah. Yep. It's a Christmas song now. It's Green Sleeves. It's Which Child Is This? It's the Lassie theme. It's all of these things. It's also a traditional English ballad dating back to 1580 with the cumbersome title, A New Northern Ditty of Ye Lady Green Sleeves. Mm -hmm. Rumored to be written by Henry VIII for Anne Boleyn. Rumored. Mm. Yes. The lady of the title may have been promiscuous as the color green had sexual connotations back then, mm. such as green gown, how to get green, and are those grass stains, how'd they get there, from doing it outdoors. Mm -hmm. Then there's another theory that the lady lust just loved green and she was a saint. A saint, I tell you, a saint. <laughs> Shakespeare mentions green sleeves three times in The Merry Wives of Windsor. Mm -hmm. Mistress Ford refers twice to the tune of green sleeves, and Falstaff later exclaims, Let the sky rain potatoes. Let it thunder to the tune of green sleeves. Potato rain. Interesting. Ah, that would hurt. Potato you, hail. You could get a concussion. But I could just imagine Falstaff standing in there with his mouth open. Um, 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 um. Meanwhile, it'd be like it'd be like Claudia with a chance of meatballs for me. I'd be standing outside with a bowl. I'd be like, thank you, okay. Yep. So how did this wind up on Truth? Mickey most heard Jeff playing it during a break and said, oh, that's so pretty. We need to put this on the album because we're starved for material. And Jeff went, okay. Yeah, and he said he played it Chet Atkins style, which from what I barely know about Chet Atkins, it's a lot of finger picking. This is the shortest song on Truth, clocking in at a minute 49. Jeff doesn't show off, just plays it straight, and he really gives it that ye olden days feel. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, we're off to King Richard's Fair in Carver Mass. Or wherever the hell he put it. <laughs> anyway, next. Bex Bolero? Nope. What is it? Rock My Plimsoll? I think I accidentally skipped that one. Do you want to talk about it? Did you accidentally or did you do it on purpose? No, I swear! I swear this one was by accident. I didn't skip it on purpose. I, I, listeners, I think it's just so she wouldn't have to listen to any more rock. No, I swear anyway. it! I swear this one All was right. supposed to be trying to avoid anything. All right, I'll take over on this one. Thanks. This is the band's take on B.B. King's Rock Me Baby. Lyrics are very similar. Jeff slows it down a tad. Mickey Waller's stutter drumming is great. It's like you think he's lost the time, but he hasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you may be wondering, what is a plimsoll? What's a plimsoll? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> it's a British term for a sneaker with a canvas upper and a rubber sole. Oh. Kind of like uh, Chuck Taylor's in the United States. Good shuffle blues. Band does a good job, and Ron does have fun singing it. I don't know how or why B.B. King did not get a songwriting credit for this. He could have lawyered up and won. Hmm. Did he ever release a statement about this, or? No, I couldn't. I couldn't find anything. Oh, did but you? then you always find like you know, hey, there's Jeff playing with BB King, and you know they're not hitting each other, so must be fine. <laughs> All right, now it's Bex Bolero. Now it's Bex Bolero. Okay. Go ahead. A bolero is a form of love song that originated in Cuba in the 19th century. And oh, Jeff, interesting. Yep, and Jeff Bex is perfection. You hear the passion in his playing with the strumming acoustic guitars, and the effect on the electric guitar makes it sound like this love is something otherworldly he's experiencing for the first time. And you can really jam and headbang to this. This would be fun for a first entrance at a wedding. Then we get to the part where it's a party because he's in love and he's happy and it's a great time. Just uninhibited and the playing source from there. A perfect instrumental track on here. And also, Dad sent me the one um, Ravel's Bolero, which is 15 minutes and was performed by a symphony orchestra in Ukraine in 2016. And it was amazing. Like, it was 15 minutes, but it didn't feel like that at all. And I downloaded it right after this because it's it's pretty much the instruments playing the same tune over and over, but they put their own little flourishes on it, and it's gorgeous. And I like the camera work on how, like, the camera just focuses in mm -hmm. on 
whoever is playing at the time. Yep, one at a time, and then you see like them layer the musicians each in more and more and more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the most famous song on Truth. Um, I heard it on HJY a lot when they used to play this type of music. Jeff and other guitarists like rocking up the classics. They can't help themselves. Mm-hmm. Dave Edmonds did something similar with Kachaturian Saber Dance. The worst defenders of this musical style were, are, and always will be mm-hmm. Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. They can take anything and turn it into a snooze fest. I don't know who those guys are. You are so lucky. Okay. Anyway, Ravel doesn't get a credit because it's public domain. Yeah. Jimmy Page does, though. Much to Jeff's annoyance because he felt that they should have been credited as co-writers. But Jimmy Page was like, hey, you know, I wrote this arrangement. I produced it. I played on it. It's mine. Mine, I tell you. Mine, 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 mine. mine. Yes. Do you agree with Jeff Page on, J- Jimmy Page on this one? Uh, I mean, Jeff says, hey, it was both of us. I threw in my two cents. I, pi- I, I, I pitched as well. I it was a lot of back and forth. Yeah. And, but it, it just kind of like devolved into he said, he said. Okay. Yeah. Well. Jeff makes it sound big. Mm-hmm. And having Keith Moon on drums helps. And you can hear Moon scream at the halfway point, And right after that scream, all hell breaks loose. Yep. But it's a great version. I am not knocking it, but Ravel's seductive original cannot be beat. No, you kind of can't. But Bex isn't too bad, though. Like, I've downloaded both of those. No, it's not. For different reasons. It's like, it's like, Ravel's, his version takes 15 minutes to play, and it just builds. It works. And it builds. It works. And it builds. But I understand... The eventual, I can't think of another word, climax. Well, you're not wrong considering it's a form of love song, so. And Jeff's is, Jeff's in and out in three minutes. This is like the wham, bam, thank you, ma'am version. Honestly, it depends on whether or not you prefer rock or classical music and whether or not your attention span can last the full 15 minutes. That's just what I would say. Like if someone's I, like, which one would you should I listen to? I'd be like, depends on what you like. I'd say listen to both. Yeah, but if you have to pick one, it's like just go based on personal taste. Mm. You get what I'd I mean? Go with one, I'd go with the original. Mm. I'd go with both. <clears throat> All right, next track, Blues Deluxe. Oh, those <laughs> drums are excellent. They have the intensity of cattle drums that you'd hear in an orchestra. Rod's little chuckle as the audience claps is cute, like, <laughs> thanks. But I'm still really sick of him by this point. <laughs> Just little licks are what keep me interested, and the piano playing is amazing on here. I can't even imagine how difficult it is to play those high notes in rapid succession so softly. That piano needed a cigarette after that. Stay for the piano playing, really, that's what makes it great. And no, Rod, you don't got it. You don't got anything on this album and make me wish I didn't have to listen to it. Wow. <laughs> Your turn. <laughs> uh, this is the band's take on B.B. King's Gambler's Blues. Mm-hmm. He did a live version in 1967, which is why I think Jeff dubbed in the fake applause. He did? And according to Jeff, I think we overdid it a bit. That makes two of us. I feel the same way because it's just so obvious and annoying. And luckily, one of the bonus tracks on the remaster is a version of Blues Deluxe without the fake applause. Nikki Hopkins gets to solo on piano a lot during this song, which I thought was very charitable of Jeff, but it's Nikki Hopkins. And so they're great. It, it's great. Then Jeff comes in and takes over with some tasteful guitar soloing because, you know, you can't let the piano player show him up. Mm-hmm. And again, I am surprised that B.B. King did not get a songwriting credit. The first verse is all B.B. Everything after that, Jeff and Rod came up with, I think. Hmm. I'm not 100% sure. Okay. But again, see you in court, Sonny. <laughs> Next track, I Ain't Superstitious. You ain't? Well, good opening with the guitar and drums once again. These lyrics remind me of the Michael Scott quotation, I'm not superstitious, but I am a little stitious. <laughs> yeah, and this guy saw a black cat cross his path and dogs are howling, so something's gonna happen. But with Rod, I don't care. I hope he sees a black cat everywhere he goes and I'm just waiting for this album to be done so I can never hear him again. Helen Wolf's voice in the original suits this song way better. Just shows what happens when you try to outdo the original, or in this case, Gilda Lily. Okay, this was written by Willie Dixon, who did get the credit. Helen Wolf did this first, but Jeff's version was the version I heard I first heard, again on HJY, and again back when they played this sort of stuff. 
This is a great version. They also have Howlin' Wolf's, which is just unbelievable. Jeff's use of wah-wah on the guitar is what makes it memorable. Mm -hmm. It's almost like he's just having too much fun. Mm. Mick Wallace slays on the drums at the end. Oh my God, the guy is unbelievable. You look at pictures of him and you think, this guy should be teaching a college course in math or history. <laughs> it's like the last person you would think would be like this incredible and manic a drummer, but he is. Mm. Thank you, Rod. Rod turns in a terrific performance as well. He ain't superstitious, but a black cat did cross his path. And the dogs are howling. And if Jules has his way, he's just going to get run over by a car any second. <laughs> no, no, no. Don't wish that. Okay. But bad luck hasn't gotten him so far. Or has it? I don't know. You have to ask Rod. And this closes the original album. This being the remaster, there are eight bonus tracks tacked on. We're just going to focus on two. Listeners, you're welcome. First one, uh, Tally Man. Oh, thank God, it's not Rod anymore, it's Jeff. And Jeff's voice sounds fine. I can get why he chose not to sing with some of the tracks on here, but kept them instrumentals. This is about the tally man who comes and collects a pound every week, and then the other person gets what they need. They respect him to the end. And it's fine. Mm -hmm. That's it. Uh, this was written by one Graham Goldman who went out to 10CC, and he just, he just wrote so... Many great songs for the 60s. He wrote For Your Love, which the Yardbirds did. He wrote a lot of songs for the Hollies. Guy was just great. Mm. Um, and this is one of Jeff's first early singles after leaving the Yardbirds. And yes, that is Jeff on vocals. The tally man shows up every Friday at Jeff's parents' house. We give and we get, and we're always in debt. Mm. But the tally man has everything. Shoes, socks, village frocks, because that rhymes with socks. Mm -hmm. From cradle to grave, he's got everyone covered. And for some reason, this reminds me of Spinal Tap. I cannot put my finger on it as to why. It just does. Well, if that's the case, it shows the Spinal Tap did their research. They did. Final track. Hi-ho, Silver Lining. Hi-ho, Kermit the Frog here. Sorry. Uh, okay. Nice openings. Uh, sounds almost like Talking Heads for a sec. And I wrote mm. my next sentence, I wish we were listening to Talking Heads. I like the chorus of this song with a good instrumental, and that's really it. That's all I had to say. Okay. Um, quote, despite vociferous protests, unquote, from Jeff Beck, this song made it on as a bonus track Ooh. because he just absolutely hates it. This was written by Scott English and Larry Weiss. When they started writing this song, they just had hi-ho silver lining but no verses. Scott English wanted to record the song himself, so he decided to write the most stupid lyrics he could think of in order to put off producer Mickey Most. Mickey Most, of course, loved it and had Jeff Beck record it. And Jeff, as I said, he hated it, <laughs> probably because of the lyrics such as, Flies are in your pea soup, baby. They're waving at me. <laughs> Those are actual lyrics, and Jeff actually sings them. <laughs> ah. I can see why he brings such hate to it. Then why did you have us listen to this one instead of the, one of the other ones? Because it was his first, his very first one. Okay. And you need kind of need, I want you to see where he was coming from and how much he progressed. Okay. To like to to, to truth. Where he is now. Okay. Um, at the end, the song fades out. Then at the three minute and thirty five second mark, the guitar fades in, wailing away for about twenty seconds, like a preview of things to come eventually. Hi Ho went on to become popular with friends of fans of numerous UK football clubs where it's used as a chant. The fans replace Silver Lining with the name of their football club. Mm. And again, the song has such a final a spinal tap feel to it, back when tap was starting out in the 60s. I could see Madness covering this song back in the 80s. It just has that kind of goofiness to it. Unintentional goofiness, but goofy. Oh. All the way. Overall, get rid of Rod Stewart and this is great. <laughs> you know I don't like something when I don't have much to say. Just keep the instrumentals. Oh, I feel you've had a lot to say. Well, yeah, but... Mostly Rod sucks. Yeah, just keep the instrumentals and you appreciate how good a musician Jeff Beck was. All of the tracks are not ones I listen to because you can't even hear his playing. And all I wanted to hear was his playing, but everyone else was making noise. So just Google Jeff Beck Instrumentals if you want a better appreciation of the man than this. Anything else is an insult to his memory. 
Wow. Then you should probably pick up Blow by Blow. Is that his all-instrumental album? Well, it started after that um, when he realized, yeah, I think I'll just want to play and and not have anyone sing. But no, like I said earlier, Blow by Blow, produced by George Martin, looked upon as possibly his best instrumental album. Okay. All right. Um, and now for a little side trip. Okay. The reason that there's so much American blues on Truth is the blues was made available in England by sailors back in the late 50s and early 60s. Mm -hmm. When they sailed to the United States, they'd just buy up records knowing they could sell them for a profit back home. They'd scoop up whatever they could, didn't matter who it was, as long as it was American. And mm -hmm. the British kids ate it up, especially a band like the Rolling Stones. Mm. Then the Stones would come to the States and play covers of the blues songs they'd learned, and people would ask, how did you write that? Oh, and then geez. they'd explain, well, this stuff was American, but don't you, as an American fan, know that? Nope, they had no idea. No, because we're a bunch of racists. <laughs> <laughs> so in the 60s, you had these blues guys who'd been recording a good 20 years or more in obscurity becoming, becoming sensations overnight. In England. And eventually in the U.S. And they'd go to England and they could not believe how people would lose their minds over them. People like Muddy Waters, mm -hmm. John Lee Hooker, and Howling Wolf were treated like gods over in England. And so the Brits, during the British invasion, introduced Americans to their own music. Isn't that sad? <laughs> it's also like when Jimi Hendrix, like in history class... My teacher was talking about how Jimi Hendrix was technically part of the British invasion because he had to go over there to, to become, become famous, famous yep. because everybody here was fucking racist and hated his guts. And I think if Beck could have held the band together and the FAA had worked more on original songwriting, they could have given Led Zeppelin a serious run for the money. They really could have, but they just couldn't keep it together. And like I said, you know, there was fighting and it just, you know. Didn't help. At least the guys in Zeppelin, they got along, yeah. which helped. Until their drummer died, which is very sad. And I give them credit because they called it a day because they knew it was over, that they could just never carry on. No, but his son's a good drummer. Yes, he is. Watch the uh, Hearts uh, cover of Stairway to Heaven at the Kennedy Center Honors if you want to see how good a drummer. Is it Scott Bonham? That's his Jason. Name? Jason Bonham. Sorry. I'm sorry. You're, you're There's, still learning. I got a bunch of names floating around in my head. Anyway, if you want to hear how good a drummer Jason Bonham is. Okay? Okay. All right. All right, as always, thank you for listening to the latest installment of My Dad Listens to This. Like, comment, subscribe, and all that jazz. Because remember, the more you interact with the video, the higher a chance we have of being seen on the YouTube homepage. If you follow me on social media, I post all the episodes there. If you're friends with my dad, just say what episode you want to listen to and we'll email it right to your inbox. And as always, if you appreciate what we do here, just please leave a little bit of change in the Ko-Fi tip jar. We really appreciate it. As always, thank you for listening to the latest moment of my dad listens to this. We'll be back next time with another album today, Pick and Gripe About Dad. Anything you want to say before we sign off? Jeff Beck was a phenomenal guitarist, and that's the truth.